Vidam Vas, Combinator here with a Canadian theme story. No, no, not this stuff. Regardez l'ordinateur, sacré bleu. Ah, yes, this is the Canadian built Hyperion, and the story behind it is epic. It revolves around brinkmanship, successes, failures, probably romance, but most importantly, Canadian technological entrepreneurship. Around the turn of the millennium, Hewlett Packard had a famous ad campaign revolving around a shed. At the time, I had an internship with the newly split off from HP Instrument Division, Agile Technologies. The HP Garage campaign pushed innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, a sense that every employee could achieve their potential at HP. Indeed, a high school senior me was swept downstream with the propaganda, feeling passion, belonging, a sense of duty to my unpaid yet very rewarding six month stay there. Everything was going well. My bosses were rich, investing heavily in tech stocks. The work atmosphere was productive, yet laid back. There was ample time between studying C++, Visual Basic, integrating Fireman screen dumps, and linking extra content from an access database to shoot the shit about matters of life. First cars, family, and even car audio systems. Coworkers were seen smiling even in the morning. No doubt bolstered by the famous HP breakfast, which was, at the very least, free and caffeine injected, and every day felt like a Thursday afternoon. Not quite the weekend, but the almost there feeling, combined with the productivity still pushing forward in the afterglow of the midweek thrust. A satisfying place to be. And then the market crashed. Back in the 70s, there was another company up in the frigid Canadian beaches called Mitel, which started out very HP-esque, out of a garage. This one sold lawnmowers, though. Like the unison of the hyphenated name of Hewlett Packard, Mitel was a portmanteau of Matthew, M-I, and Terry, T-E, and depending on which source is cited, L for lawnmower or E-L for electronics. The founders, Michael Kaupland and Terry Matthews, started their business in 1973 after working for Microsystems. Parent company was Northern Electric, then finally became Nortel. Like the telecommunications giant they left, Mitel st started with telephone systems in Canada. Their first successful product, indeed the first fully digital PBX, was the SX2000. As compared to an analog equivalent of the day, the SX2000 slashed power use and packed more punch in a lighter, smaller enclosure, as well as being 25 times faster than competing Northern's SL1. Their SX2000 PBS was supposed to be paired with IBM computers, but they could not work out the bugs in time. The contract instead went to Rome. However, they bounced back with a joint venture between American satellites and were routing satellite transmissions to ground stations using the tech they've pioneered themselves. They also won a distribution agreement worth three million to sell small business telephones in Japan via Pioneer Electronics. Later in 1982, the SX2000 was paired with computers made by Digital Equipment Corporation as well as International Computers of England. Despite a four million dollar loss in the first quarter of 1983, the threat to Mitel's existence was minimal. They had 5,000 employees worldwide, as well as a strong R&D team. Dynalogic Infotech, Bitech, Bitech com term, Bitech slash Dynalogic. There were several companies that merged and changed names that were ultimately responsible for the Hyperion. We'll start with a brief mention of Bitech, who acquired Dynalogic in January of 1983. Briefly, Bitech was a joint venture capital company formed by Mitel's co-founder, Kaupland, as well as Glenn St. John. Bitech, not feeling like being left out of the telecom race, started investing in Imaginamics Incorporated, who built blotters with built-in telephones and calculators, as well as Nabu Manufacturing Corporation, which produced home computers that connect to a central program bank via cable television, and even by satellite in 1983, to get programs from it. Home banking, shopping, ticket booking, not unlike France's already existing Minitel, but with multimedia flair. With this kind of communications background and programming prowess, it is clear why there is an acoustic coupler and modem integrated into Hyperion as well as its own HDOS operating system. The company was rapidly moving, a tech upstart with uncertain grounding despite having good financial backing. Ultimately, the Hyperion would have to fight on three fronts, protectionism, duty customs tariffs, and perhaps something within its direct control, IBM compatibility. Ironically, it was one of the founders of Danalogic, Murray Bell, who got his first start interfacing a floppy drive to read information directly into microcomputers, much like the larger IBM computers did to mainframe computers. At the time, microcomputers still used punch cards or magnetic tape. Murray was employed at Data General but had to quit to pursue his disk drive to microcomputer interfacing, 
but before leaving, caught the attention of Gary Davis, a salesman who solicited printers to Data General. Davis recruited his own boss to the venture, and with each partner putting down $5,000 of entrepreneurial due, founded Dynalogic Corporation. The company was a lukewarm success, adapting diskette drives to hodgepodge systems. In 1976, $75,000 venture capital loan from the Ontario government briefly held the company afloat, and on the brink of bankruptcy, CNCP Telecommunications placed an order for Dynalogic diskette drives. In the next three years, CNCP purchased 500 disk units, and the millions of dollars in steady revenue went to design of an advanced microcomputer. They had sold a number of systems, but they were designed from an engineering principle. They had lacked the ever-important marketing aspect. Dynalogic's microcomputer could only run its own software, which is somewhat what happened to the later Hyperion, rather than the then-dominant CPM. They had chosen instead to program in Unix, and writing the hipster adage of doing something before it was cool, <coughs> perhaps. By 1979, Dynalogic had sold more than 300 computers, creating a $1 million annual profit. Bell admits, We never sold enough of any one thing to get that critical mass which you really need to grow as a company. The recession in 1981, combined with the slowing momentum of the company, emptied coffers. In the spring of 1981, Bell's bank manager suggested that they talk to Glenn St. John, president of Bitech Management. Dynalogic had not failed to impress, and received an 80% share infusion. They started work on a system that could combine a portable computer and an electronic mail terminal. They had decided to base it on whatever industry standard IBM was using at the time. To understand how technology evolved in Canada versus the USA, one has to understand the political and economic climate that reigned in Canada at the time. From Knights of the New Technology, a book about Canadian tech giants of the early 80s, is painted a picture. Canada's obsessive, persistent belief in cultural protectionism is present within bodies such as the CRTC. The federal government's technological contribution to a space communications is immense, but its attempt to manipulate the technology for political and cultural ends is a disaster and threatens to cost the country its leadership in satellite communications. In 1977, this manifested itself when the CRTC used its regulatory powers to disallow Telesat to associate with telephone companies, essentially halting Telesat's work for several months when the ruling was reversed. This caused delays in the building of the Annex series of satellites. This had the unintended side effect of allowing private American companies room to grow and eventually threaten the Canadian communications sector. Another Canadian specificity was the draconian traces of the 19th century industrial protectionism still present in the early 1980s, which enforced duties and tariffs to cross-border commerce. Such duties, and their accompanying delays, were blamed by some for the failure of Canadian high-tech manufacturers to compete. William Hutchinson, founder of Canadian Advanced Technology Association, observed that barriers or tariffs and taxes succeeded only in prolonging the agony of Canada's shoemakers and copycat manufacturers, who did little research on their own, and they likely killed off the first serious attempts to build computers in Canada. This was the playing field on which the Hyperion vied for points. This was all before the advent of the now-defunct NAFTA, which would have eased the Hyperion's troubles greatly. In order to get parts for the construction of the Hyperion, import fees and delays would be the norm. Exported computers and their components were subject to a duty refund. However, until the computers were exported, the government kept the money. It was not out of the norm to have a department that handles forms for such refunds. Says Hutchinson, What we want and need most is a free access to the American market. That's the only way the Canadian company will be successful. You should be able to build a computer in Ottawa and sell it in the United States just as easily as you could from California. Another vicious opponent of protectionism, Ian Sharp, of IPSA Toronto fame, adds, We're all going to go out of business here. That sort of technique just doesn't work. If we don't have all the silly restrictions and taxes on tariffs, Ontario could be a haven for the information industry. We're just losing opportunities. There could literally be thousands and thousands more jobs in the computer business in Toronto if the governments would create an environment which would encourage it. Back at Dynalogic, now infused with a healthy influx of Mitel money, the new portable machine's design parameters had to be sexy. They hired David Kelly, of Appalachia fame, to design the machine. The color scheme was inspired from IBM's two-tone cream and clay. In 1982, it was announced that the first IBM-compatible portable microcomputer had been made. It debuted in the spring of 1982 at Comdex in Atlantic City as the most powerful portable business computer in the world. Initial names for this revolutionary machine were Passport and Blue Chip, but in the end, Hyperion was selected after the Greek titan who was the father of the sun and the moon and Aurora, goddess of the dawn. 
Promotional material so far had cost $300,000, whereas the machine's development just under a million. The machines were not yet ready, and the weekend before the opening of Comdex, the two prototypes were not even functional. Ori Bell and his engineers worked through the weekend to make the computers viable to display. And they drew in a huge crowd, onlookers commenting on how the amber glow of the CRT and the built-in communications capabilities made the machine shine. The Hyperion was a star, and Bell realized that his creation's manufacturing process should be handled by professionals. He hired Will and Lipsky to take charge of manufacturing. Settling back down to engineering duties, Bell immediately had a setback. The once important Computerland franchise sent some eggheads to test the supposed IBM compatibility of the device. They brought along IBM software, which did not work on the Hyperion. By the fall of 1982, the original prototypes had been disassembled and no production had yet even begun. After lots of work and pressure, a dozen hand-assembled and spray-painted Hyperions are ready for the Las Vegas Comdex show. They also now accepted IBM software, mostly. A chain of stores based in Boston ordered a thousand Hyperion machines. Things were looking good, and with an additional 5,000 orders from Anderson Jacobson, and 500 or more from some sort of engineering firm that remains nameless even in the book. Bell kept demanding better marketing, citing, A good product is the only entry fee to a starting gate. During his attentive nitpicking about the box dimensions and artwork, he did not notice a power shift above him. At the start of October 1983, he was shuffled into a new position of Vice President of Technology. He would have no more direct input on the Hyperion project. Dynalogic was merged with Bytech, losing its autonomy and becoming simply a division, and Bell would receive Bytech shares. His new role would focus his talents on building Bytech into a major operating company that would eventually follow Mitel in issuing shares to the public. Kaplan had remarked that Bell's devotion to marketing was unnecessary. Additionally, he noted that Bell was not communicating often, either to his superiors or to his engineers. He did mention that Bell himself was a good engineer. Bell moved on to a larger office, however, the DataLogic moniker was dropped, and the microcomputer that he had helped design was now called the Bytech Hyperion. On March 9, 1983, Bell quit Bytech to pursue another venture business. Kaplan was sad to see him go. He did note that he had some 300,000 shares of Bytech, valued at 6 bucks each. Kaplan estimated that by the time Bytech was to go public, those shares were poised to go up to about $30 a share, Bell remarks that the shares were just a bunch of wallpaper. Ha! Huh. The tensions between the two men and Bell's loss of Dynalogic seem to have simmered, and he still paid racquetball occasionally at Kaplan's Kinsu Club. At the same time, production of the Hyperion lagged behind sales plans. In July of 1983, there was a backlog of $25 million, and only 2,000 machines had been produced. This strained Bytech's borrowing power, and the sale of Bytech's Comterm shares were needed to infuse more funds into the Hyperion project. This was the situation in mid 1983, but by 1984, both founders had left the company. Due in part to the failing floppy drives manufactured at the US Alabama plant, a not entirely IBM compatible platform, in which direct video, serial port, and system ROM calls were made to incompatible circuitry, management reshuffling, and a pre NAFTA duty environment, the Hyperion was discontinued in 1985. If you've ever used CorelDRAW, or a later version of WordPerfect, bought out by Novella in 1996, you've interacted with Kaplan's next major project after leaving Mitel. As for Terry, he went on to found new bridge networks in the mid-1980s, making ATM devices and routers. By 2000, that company had 6,500 employees and was acquired by Alcatel. Terry returned to Mitel in 2000 and turned it into a broadband communications company. On April 24, 2018, the company was purchased by Searchlight Capital Partners. Unlike its founders, the Hyperion is quite dead and all but forgotten, a chapter that might only be present in cautionary tales or case studies. An interesting foray into Canada's computing past, the underdog that was taken out back and shot, put down in its infancy. Once the compact portable secured the market and sales shot up, there was no stopping them. Well, at least until the HP Compact merger, a year after my completed co-op stint at Agilent. Compact had been the first to use Intel's 386 chip in a non-IBM computer. Imagine if it had been the Hyperion instead.